Welcome back guys to the second part of the Kuronokuseki video saga which consists of this and last week's video. Previously we had a general overview of what Kuro entailed for people who just needed an idea of what to expect when it releases but this one will be a relatively informal look at the main plot points that personally took my interest. And by discussing them I also want to see what you guys think these could manifest into going forward. Naturally expect massive spoilers for Kuro and the previous games along with some references to the sequel in Crimson Sin. So the first thing I want to talk about briefly is the desertification that is taking place in the Far East. Now this phenomena we've known about for a while. It was made clear in Cold Steel 3 when Reen is sent that letter by Yoon Kafai where he stated his investigations had clued him in that it was largely down to the depletion of the Dragon Veins or Septian Veins as we commonly know them. And it's because of the desertification of the Far East that Calvert has its wide berth of immigration which in of itself has had some historical issues that we have already seen in past arcs. In Kuro we don't see too much mention of it but we know that Hamilton the last of the three disciples had gone to the east to find solutions, but other than that, not much else has been said. I don't know if the desertification is a red herring in this story, but I personally feel it will have some significance going forward, and I'm interested to hear what others think here. Now the next point of discussion that took my eye was our Osborne replacement. Yeah, that's what I see him as at the moment in Roy Gramhart. Now, old Roy is the recently inaugurated president of the Calvert Republic, highly popular among the people and also the father of Agnes Claudel. Again, we don't see too much of Roy, but he definitely is going to be a big player in this arc. You could feel it. Of course, his debut was in Reverie. He first pulled a power play saying that if the heroes of Zamuria couldn't stop the Babel Tower, then he would take matters into his own hands. But in addition with the help of Marduk, who are also worth discussing in of themselves, but I I'll keep it under wraps for now as I'm not too certain on their role, he was able to break into the Celestial Globe and contact the Grand Master directly, something which even in forces require Campanella to navigate to. However, in this exchange, we got a brief glimpse of what Grand Heart is attempting as him and the Grand Master reach an agreement for the next two and a half years to not interfere with each of their plans. Ouroboros have their eternal recurrence plans, which forms the final part of the Orpheus final plan, while Grand Heart is pursuing research relating to other possible worlds. Now, in terms of his motivations, I can harbour a guess and say it might be related to the death of his wife as that's where Agnes believes his behaviour changed, but I think it's a bit more than that. In Kuro, we have seen that he ran initiatives that strengthened the military of Calvert as well, ultimately making it the new undisputed superpower of the continent, so who knows. I'd like to think we'll get more on him in Crimson Sin. Okay, so before we move on to the main plot points of Kuro, I want to give mention to one character who I feel was done dirty in this game. I said in last week's video that I felt most of the character arcs were decent and they still had room to grow going forward. However, in my mind, Quatra was the only one who I didn't feel get a meaningful payoff as his story was ultimately overshadowed by the revelations relating to Van. We had an idea of Quatra's background even before Kuro released as he shares the same name as a faceless character from the infamous Stardor 15. Now, is it the same person? You'd think so but that doesn't explain why Ren and Quattro don't seem to recognise each other, so I wonder there. But we do know Quattro was a surviving victim of the DG cult, we know he's highly sensitive about his body, which might point to some pretty grotesque stuff if you consider that he was part of Paradise. We know that Ren experienced horrific incidents herself, so it's not a stretch to say that Quattro might have experienced similar treatment. And of course he was forced to relive some of that when he was taken in by the Diablo Sphere. The thing is with Quattro is that I just wanted more. This is where we would finally get to have some more light shone on that horror story at Paradise, but we never get that. Van's own backstory relating to the DG cult takes over, and Quattro's involvement is relegated to a line after the final boss, which just acknowledges that he was also a victim. This was the only arc I was disappointed with, considering the connotations of the character, and I want to know if you guys think the same. Anyway, next topic of discussion relates to the Oct Genesis, which is pretty much the central plot point of the entirety of Kuro. Agnes comes to Van with the first one, and together they attempt to find the seven other prototypes. By the end of the game, they're only missing one, and each of them have notable supernatural effects that are also far-ranging. We see that in each chapter. Now, the main thing with the Oct Genesis is that they're tied to the father of the Orbal Revolution in C. Epstein, who in his letter that Agnes holds, states that the world will end unless all Oct Genesis are recovered by 120XSC. Now, we can only assume this is related to one or both of the plans that we mentioned earlier pertaining to Gramhart and Ouroboros, and then it must have some sort of link to a Septarian. I imagine the Septarian of time if I were to hazard a guess. Van had an idea of where the final genesis was, he said so when he resolved to lock himself away, but I'm interested to see where this plot point goes, especially considering what we've already seen of the Oc genesis. Add on to that the connection to the much-discussed Epstein, and you can only wonder where this will lead. 
The next point of my list somewhat relates to the Opgenesis, but only in regards to the parts of the group we're attempting to take them back from, that being the Garden. Once again, we've known about the Garden since way back in Cold Steel 4, if you've read the in-game novels 3 and 9, and it was touched on even more with the release of Reverie, where we witnessed one of the Wardens in action. Now, of course, we know that this was not the real Emperor, as he was killed within the novel, and what we witnessed was simply a simulacrum created by the Singularity Elysium. In Kuro, we see the final three Wardens, but also learn of how the Garden came to be. The much maligned Oathbreaker, current Anguis of Ouroboros, took it upon himself to merge the remnants of the DG cult that were wiped out by Cassius Bright and Co, and his old stomping ground in the Order of the Moonlight Horse, which had been mostly wiped out by Ouroboros themselves, with the likes of Sharon, Elroy, and Lucrezia joining the society. By the end of Kuro, we know that basically all of the Wardens are gone, or at least the ones that we know of. We understand that there were four, and all four are out of commission by Kuro's climax, but this doesn't make any mention of the assassins that operated under each division. Are there still remainders that lurk around? And in light of that, we already know of Freya Nine, who escaped the Warden of Swords back before Reverie, and I'm gonna say a spoiler here for the next game, Swin looks to be returning, if recent images are to be believed. What do you think? Are the Garden gone for good, or do they have a further role to play? Okay, and now our final three points are going to relate to what I consider are the three biggest plot points surrounding Kuro no Kiseki and the future direction of this arc. And the first one of that trio involves Van's relation to Mare and Grendel. Now, early on, we learn that Mare is Van's custom-made holocore AI created by Marduk, and the first Genesis gives her sentience, allowing Van to don the nightmare, so to speak, in Grendel. Now, from what I remember, Kuro doesn't give us too much on this particular plot point, and I imagine it's going to be one of the main focuses for the rest of this arc, sort of like what the Divine Knights became in Erebonia, and of course, if you've seen any of the Crimson Sin promotional material, then you'll know of another demonic gear similar to Grendel with slightly different design and a red colour as opposed to Grendel's blue. But I feel that Van's ability to don the Nightmare is somehow related to his diabolic core, which is of course the entity that was taken from him by Gerard Dantis, and even though he throws it away come the end of the game, there is still a fragment lurking within him. And it's that diabolic core that I want to discuss a bit more because, of course, the story events eventually wind and coalesce into this reveal of Van being the vessel for one of the five great demon lords. Since Sky the Third, we've been aware of the 77 devils and even fought some of them on occasion. However, among those 77, there were five newer ones that spawned when the world was reset. Again, a really curious phrase there, and they came to rule over the remaining 72. The first one we see, come the end of Kuro, is Vagrant Zion. Now, how they're going to push this plot point along, I don't know, but I have an that these demon lords are going to be central to the newer games. For example, we already know of the existence of other demonic gears, or at least designs similar to Grendel from the Crimson Sin promotional material. And if we can deduce that Grendel is somewhat linked to Van's diabolic core, which in of itself is linked to one of the five demon lords, is it possible that there are other demon gears and thus diabolic cores that house the other four lords? I mean, I'm taking a wild punt there. It could be completely off the mark, but I'm really looking forward to seeing how that develops, and it might give us an even deeper glimpse into this final points. And that relates to the so-called truth of the world. We see this concept pop up near the end of the game in Pandemonium during our fight with Gerard Dantis, and it's super interesting because up till now we know very little about the truth of Zemuria and there have been minor nods in previous games regarding events that occur outside of the understanding of what we currently know. Things that can't be explained by the laws that make up this world. Examples of that are, say, the existence of McBurn in his true form who came from the outside, the Salt Pale instance of Northambria, the weapons that McBurn and Luve used that were forged by so-called divergent laws, then you consider the role of the DG cult who were obsessed with disproving the existence of the goddess to the point that they experimented with pleromagrass to create Gnosis, which in its final form, as McBurn stated in Cold Steel 4, allowed them to break free from the shackles put on them by the goddess. Think of Joachim, for example, and all the things he mentions when he transforms. It's quite clear that many of these phenomena are just not possible to comprehend for many people who live within the bounds of this world, and we once again see credence pay to that when Mare is explaining details to the Solutions Office but some of her lines are notably blurred out. And the group are aware of this and think that maybe they're simply not able to comprehend what Mare is saying, as if they lack the intrinsic understanding of the concept she's talking about. Kuro is now pushing that envelope more when you consider the role of the likes of Gramhart in his pursuit of the truth of possible worlds, that in of itself was supported by Vagrant Zion. And in a way, we have seen the existence of multiple worlds already if you think back to Reverie, or at least the possibility that they could exist. Elysium was able to create an outcome that 
that shouldn't have been. Naturally, we followed the story after the true ending of Cold Steel 4, where Reen survived and the Septarians of Fire and Earth were used to bring about a miracle. However, in Reverie, we see the manifestation of Reen from the normal ending, the one where he sacrificed himself to end Ishmelga and ultimately ended up merging with it to become Ishmelga Reen. Then you consider other lines from Dante, such as when he's about to pass on, he states that he knows Gehenna doesn't exist. That line again is really intriguing to me because the only time we've seen Gehenna was during the events of Sky the Third due to Kevin's stigma, which represents his own idea of what Gehenna is. But we've never actually seen it in the real world, so to speak. There's just so many little tidbits that I latched onto come the end of Kuro, and the truth of the world was the one that got me excited the most. I feel like Falcom has been building this concept up for ages, never putting it at the forefront, but giving us just enough to justify its existence, and I personally can't wait to see what they do with that. But either way guys, those are my personal highlights from Kuro, the things that I hooked onto. I dare say there were plenty of areas I missed, but I only took notes on the areas that took my fancy, and wanted to share them with you, so if there was anything else you were interested in from the game, throw them in the comments, I'd love to read them. See you next week, and peace.